Yeah. Just remember that in the future. If I tell you to be seated after that song, don't do it. And then I'll, I'll just be like, okay, well, yeah, yeah, she'll remind you, yeah. Well, when I was uh, in high school, <clears throat> there was a video game called Lemmings. Some of you may, have, may remember this game if you were gamers. I wasn't really much of a gamer, and certainly video games today aren't like they were back then. They're much more advanced, but this game became pretty popular when I was in high school. It was a game where there were these little creatures called Lemmings, and they would appear on the screen, and there were different levels, and this is one of those levels. This might have been even the starting level, and what you would have to do is you would have to set up a way for these Lemmings to get to safety. Lemmings were honestly pretty stupid. You can see them there in all of their stupidity. They walk toward whichever direction seems right to them or seems the most promising, and you were supposed to fix that by giving them a way to freedom. You can see it in that level there. That little door represents freedom for them, but they're pretty dumb. They're just walking off the edge over and over again, coming to their death. Now, the aim of the game was that you were supposed to deliver them to safety. But truth is, it was fun uh, a few times on every level uh, to just kill them, to, de <laughs> to, to devise some kind of elaborate system that thought that, uh, that made them think that they were going to safety and it would end up being, in, being you know, to their destruction. Now, truth is, us humans aren't that much different from uh, these little lemmings that you see, and you can get rid of them now because otherwise everybody's just going to be watching lemmings for, die for the whole uh, message. Uh, but what you saw on the screen isn't a whole lot different from what we're like as humans oftentimes. In fact, uh, humanity has sometimes been described as lemmings. There was one def dictionary definition I looked up that when I looked up lemming, and this word is in every dictionary now, and this definition says this, it's a person who follows the will of others, especially in a mass movement, and heads into situations or circumstances that are dangerous, foolish, or destructive. Now, if that doesn't describe humanity in general, I don't know what does. And as we come to Revelation chapter 13, this is another picture of humanity as lemmings. This is how Revelation chapter 13 kind of presents us humans. We often follow those roads that look so, so promising, but they're created by those who pave the way to our, uh, of our destruction. And in our text today, we're going to see who the master road builder is in this world. The one who builds roads for the masses, yes, but he also builds specialized roads for Christians as well, Christians just like you and me. And he hopes that, that we will take those roads. And the thing is, those roads lead to the exact same places as those roads he builds for the masses lead. We have to remember that this, this letter is written to Christians. It's not written so much to people outside of the church, although it, it is good to be read by everybody, but it is written as a warning to Christians in this chapter. Now, as we come to chapter 13, we need to remember what we learned from chapter 12 last week. And chapter 12 told us that with the resurrection of Jesus, that old dragon, Satan himself, he's been booted out of his influence in heaven. And now he has been isolated to the realm of this world that we live in. And he's angry and he's upset. And so we read at the end of, of, uh, of chapter 12 that he has raged that he takes out on one people group in particular, and that's against God's people. We know also that his time is short. This is something that chapter told us. But in the shortness of it, his rage is all the, more, all the more fierce. And our chapter today, chapter 13, calls Christians to endure through it all, to endure despite the tactics that Satan uses against us. And his weapons are the weapons that God has allowed him, has given him permission to use in this world. Those weapons could be governments. Those weapons could be ideologies. Those weapons could be the workplace, sometimes even our own family situation. But Satan uses all of these things to direct the praise and the focus of Christians away from God and to something else, specifically in this chapter, to the idolatry of worshiping Satan himself or the systems of this world that he's put in place. And how we respond is going to tell us who we belong to. Are we bought 
by God? And are we stamped with God's seal of eternal life on our foreheads and on our hands, as it says in other chapters? Or do we belong to Satan and wear the mark of the beast? Listen, do not fall for all of the delusions that Satan gives to us. Don't fall for the delusions of Satan, but stand on the promises of God. Don't fall for the delusions of Satan, but stand on the promises of God. Well, as we think about that, and that first point of that, what I just said, don't fall for the delusions of Satan, we have to think about what some of those delusions are. And I think the first delusion that we can be under is that Satan himself isn't real, or he's not very active at least. I don't think there's many of us in here that would think that Satan wasn't real, but there's a whole lot of us in here that live our lives day to day as if Satan's not all that active. And we're not really watching for him. Now, I want you to think about this chapter. And if you want to read through it again quickly, that's fine. But as we read through this chapter, you're going to notice there isn't a whole lot said about Satan in this chapter. There's just a couple little verses that talk about Satan at all. This chapter really is focused on these two beasts. We're introduced to, I call them the Beastie Boys. That's another thing from my high school years. There was a, a rap group called the Beastie Boys. Well, these guys are the real Beastie Boys. They were just kind of uh, little uh, rappers, maybe doing some of his, some of his will. But, uh, but in here, we have the real Beastie Boys. We're introduced to Beast 1 and Beast 2. And they take up almost all of the visibility in this chapter, even though Satan, we don't see a whole lot about him. Well, if we're going to talk about these beasts, we have to talk a little bit about who they are. And in order to understand who they are, we need to, uh, as with every text in the Bible, we need to understand what the text meant to its original hearers, because once we understand that, we can line up their circumstances and see they don't differ all that much from ours, and then apply the text. And so who are these two beasts? How would the first hearers of John who wrote this book have understood these two beasts? Well, the moment that they heard it, there's no question about it, that their memory would have been jogged back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, I'll give you a sec to do that. We want to look back at Daniel chapter 7, closer to the end of your Old Testament. I would probably say if you get halfway through your Bible, you're going to be right in the book of Psalms, more than likely. Keep going until you find the book of Daniel. It's a pretty major book, so it won't take you long. But their memories would have been jogged back to Daniel chapter 7. Because there are some other beasts that are very dominant in the book of Daniel that appear in Daniel chapter 7. And if you're at Daniel chapter 7, I want, I want to read verses 2 through 7. Daniel has a vision. And Daniel said, In my vision at night I was watching. And suddenly the four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea. Four huge beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. I continued watching until its wings were torn off. It was lifted up from the ground, set on its feet like a man, and given a human mind. Suddenly another beast appeared, a second one, that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side. Or, sorry, it was raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up, gorge yourself on flesh. After this, while I was watching, suddenly another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. It had four heads and it was given dominion. After this, I, while I was watching in the night vision, suddenly a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and it trampled with its feet whatever was left. It was different from all of the beasts before it, and it had ten horns, not unlike the beast that has ten horns in our chapter. Now, if, we're, if you're to read on in Daniel chapter 7, you're going to find out that these beasts did not refer to a single person. These beasts represented kingdoms, nations. And so this is what the original hearers would have thought of, and that's the way these beasts normally uh, appear. They symbolize, Daniel chapter 7 isn't the only place that the beasts appear, but they always symbolize nations. If you go down, on down and you read the, uh, Daniel chapter 7 and we look back, we're going to find out that that first beast was Babylon, the second beast was Assyria, the third one was Persia, and the final beast with ten horns was the empire of Rome itself, which was yet to come. 
John's hearers would have identified this beast with the nation of Rome and its emperor. In fact, some of you have that little revelation book that I gave out to you. I know one person asked if, if I, that's kind of what informed all my views here. It isn't. These are the, the, church, the, the, the historical church. This has been the view of the church for almost 2,000 years, what we're saying here this morning. John's description of the beast having blasphemous names on its heads picks up on Roman imperial coins. For example, the coins, they would all have a picture of different Caesars. And around those Caesars, they had what Christians would have considered blasphemous names. Son of God, Caesar divine. And then on the other side of the coin would be inscriptions to different Roman divinities to promote the gods of Rome. They would celebrate these different gods. We know, if we look back into the time of Rome, it wasn't in early Rome, but at the time of the Christians, the emperors were starting to worship themselves and have the people worship them as well. And that was increasingly central to daily life in Rome. When it talks about the beast coming up out of the sea, this is where the governors of Rome would arise from when they sailed in for their meetings. They all come from the sea, from different nations, through, or uh, from, from the different areas of Rome, through Ephesus. And so I think this presents to us what these first hearers would understand when they think of the first beast. And it will inform, as we'll see, our view as well. We notice also with this first beast, and this is where it starts to become more relevant to us, that it says that this first be- beast in in uh, verse 3, had a fatal wound on its head. Now, there are a lot of commentators that look at this and say, well, that's probably referring to what happened with Rome under Nero. Some of you maybe know a little bit about history in here, but Rome had this one emperor called Nero. He was insane. He was nuts. And what he did was he almost brought the nation of Rome down single-handedly by himself. He caused civil war. And he actually burned down the city of Rome, his own city. He blamed it on the Christians afterwards, but none of the Romans believed it. They all knew it was Nero. And the entire nation almost collapsed. Then the next emperor, Vespasian, he rebuilt it up again. And so a lot of commentators see this, and they say, ah, this is Rome being kind of resurrected under Vespasian. That may, might be true. But there are others, myself included, who look at this uh, wound that it was fatal, but it was healed to maybe not only refer to Nero as they would have heard it, heard it, but to symbolize the unending rise and fall of all kinds of ungodly nations throughout history. Over and over, they rise, they fall, they rise, they fall, they rise, they fall, and it will continue to happen until Jesus returns. So even though John's hearers may have may have looked at this and thought of Nero. This is talking about Nero in Rome. We need to take our cue from Daniel chapter 7 that tells us about repeated kingdoms that rise up and down, that are represented by this beast whose wounds, though fatal, they seem to rise again. Nations and powers throughout the ages who make war against God's people. And there are plenty of them throughout history, history, and there are plenty of them that exist today. May it never be that our nation becomes boldly one of those, though it seems that we are heading down that road. Who is the second beast? That can be cured, by the way, if it's God's will, if we get out there and we fulfill the Great Commission. This isn't part of my sermon, so I want to get off on a tangent here. But if we get out and we preach the gospel, guys, that can reverse. So let's do it. Back to the sermon. Sorry. So who is the second beast? Who is the second beast? We see this other beast arises from the land. And again, how would they have understood this? It probably denotes Asia Minor itself. So we know the nation of Rome was a huge empire, and they went around conquering everyone that they could. And once they had conquered all these smaller nations, the contest was on by these uh, capital cities in these smaller nations. In fact, John writes to a number of them at the start of uh, of, uh, of Revelation, Smyrna, Ephesus, all of these. But competition was on to see who could pay the best lip service to Rome and get, all the, get the most benefits of Rome. And these would be uh, seen as those who not for, came in from the ocean, but were from the land surrounding things. So this, I, I think, is probably those specific leaders 
those presidents, those false teachers they, in our day and those false preachers who, who, who come and they pay lip service to things of this world, whether they be governments or ideologies, and they fill, they fill people's minds with hope so that it directs people to the kingdoms of the first beast and to bow down to the powers that be. Now, this, the, this, this second beast also has something that's unique to it as well. And that is, if you look at verse, uh, uh, verse 16, it says, It makes everyone, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, the beast's name or the number of its name. That number, of course, is 666. What do we do with this? Well, as you know, there have been any number of guesses, almost as many guesses as there are Bible interpreters out there. A lot of them will say that if you take the number 666 and you transcribe it uh, from Hebrew into Greek, and then you put it into a number, you come up with the number 666. Uh, some say if you reverse it, you can come up with the number 616, which is in some of our ancient Greek manuscripts. And that number can be, again, can be described to Caesar Nero. This is called Dramatria. And it was a practice in apocalyptic literature also outside of the Bible, um, where they were afraid to say who it was specifically because they might get punished for it. So they put the, num the, the name into a number. The problem with Dramatria is that you can make anything say just about anything by adding a title by appealing to another language latin was prevalent at the time and you can make it say other names with latin and so certainly yes it could have referred to nero but if we consider the rest of the book of revelation almost every other number in the book of revelation is a figurative number and where john does appeal to things in hebrew he actually tells us this is in hebrew he doesn't do that with this number. So I don't think this is necessarily referring to gematria, because every other number has a figurative significance almost. It also says that it is the number of, some translations say, a man. If you look at it in the Greek, there is the lack of the letter a, or, or what we call the indefinite article in there, a, it could be translated as the number of a man. It could also say, and this is how I would translate it, and I'd teach students, I was teaching Greek to translate it, anything without an article, first translated as just man. And then if it doesn't make sense, put the a in. So it can be translated as this is the number of man. Now, the number six does appear all through the Bible. And almost always when it appears, it's shown in contrast to the number seven. Perfect example is when we have the sixth day and the seventh day of creation. We know that the seventh day was the day things are completed. And the number seven is also in, in Scripture a lot, showing that this is God's number of perfection or completion. And so when we have this number six, I think what this is, this is the number of man. This is something incomplete. It's something corrupt. It's something that is inferior to the number seven. Now, we have three of them. Why a triple six? In this chapter, you'll also notice something else. There's a lot of Satan mimicking God. First of all, you have a beast who's been resurrected, so to speak, received a fatal wound, came back. We also see that there are miracles being performed. Jesus did miracles. Now Satan is performing miracles. We also have three characters in here, what some commentators call the unholy trinity, Satan, the first beast, and the second beast, and Amazingly, their roles kind of mimic the roles of the persons of the Trinity. And so we have an unholy Trinity in here. And I think this triple six is indicative of the imperfection of this unholy Trinity that Satan tries to set up to overturn God. We also see something of a triple threat right in the book of Genesis as well. As Satan turns God's creation, which was supposed to be God, Man and creation, and Satan flips that on its head so that creation speaks to the man, and God and man follows this, and God and he puts God as the in the third place. And so we see Satan in the scriptures, right from the beginning to the ending, trying to mimic, though doing in a corrupt and imperfect way, that which God has set up. This number, I think, represents mankind 
in his fallen state, in his inferior state, in his imperfect and unholy state. I think it represents an unholy trinity, Satan and his worldly governments and those deceivers that direct us away from God. These are the systems, these are the people that Satan has set up in this world to deceive it all, to deceive us all. But here's something that we can't forget. Even though this text speaks, it's dominated by these beasts, let's not forget who's behind it all. The one at the very, very start of our text, that dragon is standing up there on the sand of the sea. And in verse 7, it also talks about him as well. He is the one who's behind it all. And he's standing back and he's giving authority and power to these beasts, these deceivers who he puts in place to direct us away from God. Now, what does this mean for us? What does all of this mean for us? First of all, it means that we have to be discerning when it comes to the beast. Because this first beast is real. And he is found in this world's governments, in this world's philosophies and ideologies that they're being taught all through the land at our universities and in our educational system today. Be discerning because this beast is real. And this first beast comes in many forms. He comes in many versions. Buddhism, Islam, LGBTQ ideologies. If you don't think that is a, that is a monolithic thing that can dominate people, you just ask any Christian who's been freed from that lifestyle, and they will tell you it is all-consuming. Their entire identity is wrapped around that. And this beast will continue to mutate and morph until Jesus returns. You don't believe that. Look at the LGBTQ movement. For example, it, just, it started out L, just LG, and then it was B, and then it was T, and now it's Q, and, and now it's a plus sign, anything. It continues and all of these things will continue to mutate and morph until Jesus returns. The second beast. We have to be discerning when it comes to the second beast. Those individuals that direct us toward the first beast. We may not look at the first beast and say, oh, that's something I want to follow. But then comes along this person or this famous person. And they have charisma. Or they have messages of hope. I remember uh, one president back in, I think it was 2008, that was what his thing was. His poster said, hope on it. It was almost like he was a Messiah coming in. These second beasts, they provide examples of good living. One that I think of has a book out there called Your Best Life Now. Sometimes these beasts, we need to be really careful because sometimes these beasts even pose as contraries to those beasts that we recognize as bad. And as Christians, we can have knee-jerk reactions to things that are bad, so much so that other beasts come along and say, aha, I see that knee-jerk reaction, that's where I'm going to get them. And they provide a contrary view. that looks like it's contrary, but guess what? It all belongs to that first beast. And we need to be careful. Here's the thing. Any system any government, any philosophy, any ideology, any teaching that does not find its origin in God and in God's word, it is from Satan. The first century Christians, they knew this. They knew this well. They were at risk of being tempted, very tempted, to follow systems that were instituted in Rome. When it says that this beast made it so that they couldn't buy or sell unless he has the mark, we may look at that and say, well, what does all that look like? First century Romans knew what that, Roman Christians knew what that looked like. They would say, I know what this means. I can't be part of my trade guild. I'm a fisherman. I can't be part of that trade guild because they demand that I worship their God. I'm a blacksmith. They have their God. I'm a weaver. They have their God. And if you're not part of the trade guild, you cannot trade or sell. They would have known instantly what that meant. The mark on their hands or forehead, they would not have taken that as literal, as some kind of a chip or tattoo that gets put on us or some kind of UPC code that gets put on our arm. Why would we take it as literal? We've seen 
uh, up to this point, there's been two other times where a mark has been given on the hand and forehood, forehead, and that is with God's people. We don't take that one as literal. Why would we take this one as literal? It doesn't make any sense. And again, in 22 verse 4, it's going to tell us about God's mark being on the foreheads and arms uh, of, of believers. Here is where the mark is. This is where the mark is. If we don't bear the evidence of being sealed by God, into God by our obedience and our resolve, if we don't bear that evidence, then we have the stamp of the beast on us. That is the mark. It's just like the old thing we say, oh, you can't sit on a fence as a Christian. You're either on one side or the other. If we are not obedient to God, if we do not show evidence that his seal is stamped on our foreheads and on our hands, then it's the other mark. It is the mark of the beast that we bear. Another thing that this tells us, guys, is that there is a real cost to being a Christian. You and I as Westerners, we don't feel this cost much yet. If we feel it at all. But there is a real cost to being a Christian. So don't be deceived that God is going to keep you as a faithful Christian from hardship. Don't be deceived. He, there is no promise in the scriptures that says that we will, if you're a Christian now, you won't have any hardship. In fact, if you believe that, you haven't read your Bible. Jesus says, they will persecute you if you follow me. These are not figurative threats. These are real threats that the first century Christians knew well. Look at verse 10. It says, if anyone is to be taken captive, into captivity he goes. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword he will be killed. This calls for endurance and faithfulness from the saints. Guys, these are real threats. There is a cost to following Christ. And it calls for endurance because Satan is real. He puts that sword there. He puts that captivity there. He puts those threats there so that we will be scared of them. And we'll say, what's the path of least resistance that I can take? And it's, he puts those paths there too, those roads there and the roads that will lead you astray by promises to better things that won't cost you. And you know what? In times of real suffering, that is hard. It may not be that hard for us, but you go to Pakistan today or you go to Iran today, even in China today, and you try to be a Christian the path of least resistance is very tempting. You go back into the first century where all they had to do was, when they entered into that trade guild meeting, was to simply bow before a God and then you can continue on your merry way. Guys, Satan knows by what he's put in our way to scare us that there are promises of better things that he gives to us and we have to endure and we have to be faithful, and we have to be careful we don't fall for the delusions of Satan. Well, if we're not going to fall for the delusions of Satan, how are we going to do that? We have to stand on the promises of God. That's what we have to do. Stand on the promises of God. And that's my second point here this morning. Now, when we look at this chapter, this isn't a chapter that you know, you dance around to and you say, hey, kids, you want to go have fun today? And then sit down and read Revelation chapter 13. It's kind of a dark and kind of a gloomy chapter. Truth is, most of the news here is bad news. It focuses on the influences of systems in this world and the effect that it can have on unbelievers as a whole, but also on believers too. There are massive systems in place. There are multiple systems in place, not just government, like we said, education systems. Uh, industry, advertising, gambling, you name it. And Satan has clever agents everywhere, agents of hope in this first piece, whether they be talk show hosts, whether they be religious leaders, whether they be political leaders. There's all kinds of ways to, to be led away from God and to become enslaved to Satan himself. But even with all that said, even in the darkest of biblical chapters, of which this isn't the darkest, but even in the darkest places, God never leaves us without hope. And in this chapter 2, there is still the promise of eternal life for those who belong to God. Like we said, not a bed of roses. Let's look at it. Look at verse 7. 
This is the news for us as Christians. It was permitted to the first beast to wage war against the saints and to conquer them. Oh, yay. No, not there. Look at verses 9 and 10 again. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. That's God saying, hey, Christians, listen up. If anyone's to be taken captive, into captivity he goes. If anyone's to be killed with a sword, with a sword he'll be killed. Happy there? No. Not a, again, no happiness. Not too happy there. But right in the middle of those verses, verse 7 and verses 9 and 10, there is something that is incredibly happy. And this talks about the unchanging inscriptions that we find written in the book of life. Look at this one. All those who live on the earth will worship it, worship the first beast. Everyone whose name was not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slaughtered. Now that is a loaded sentence. It doesn't just say everyone will worship him except those written in the book of life. It goes on written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slaughtered. There's a lot there, and there's a lot of hope there because what we see is in the midst of worldwide deception, there is one group, there is only one group, but there is a group who is not affected and who is not deceived. And that group is the people whose names are written in the book of life. They were people who were once dead to God, but now they are alive in Christ. Paul says that about the Christians in Romans chapter 6. So you too, even though you were once dead, consider yourselves now dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's whose names are written in this book of life. And it's not just a book of life that, you know, you can live in this world. No, this is a book of eternal life. Because it says in chapter 10, if anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword he'll be killed. In chapter 7, that some of these Christians will be conquered. This is talking about more than just this life. This is talking about written in the name, written in the book of eternal life. Those who will one day, even if they have died or been killed, will be resurrected and will never, ever die again. Look at what else it says about this book of life. Like I said, this is a loaded sentence. This book of life is one that has been written from eternity past, it says. Not, written from the foundation of the world. That means that it is unchanging. There is no one who can come along and edit this. It's not like Satan sits down with God and says, let's take a look at this book again and see who we might take out of here. This has been written once and for all, and God is not like a man. He does not change his mind. This book is set and whoever's name is in there, it will always be in there. And then I think the best part is, where we, is the last part where we find our guarantee that this book is effective because it is the book of life of the lamb who was slaughtered. This isn't a book that was just written by some human being. This isn't a book that just bore some kind of seals. This is a book that was written and made certain through the blood of the lamb who is slaughtered. Jesus is the one who guarantees every single name in this book. And we know that Jesus isn't just a man. He, he, he showed us by being res, raised from the dead. And now he sits with God and intercedes for us. And if, and, and, and if your name is written in this book of life, that means he was slaughtered for you, for your sins. He paid for your sins and gave you his righteous standing the great exchange, so that you might always be in that book. And then end of verse 10, it says, after it says, with the sword he'll be killed, this calls for endurance and faithfulness from the saints. Guys, we have to endure. It calls for endurance. That means that this race that we run, it is, it's, it's not a sprint. You know, in high school, I was a sprinter. And that was my thing. And I remember whenever we got to run the 100 meter, all the student body came to watch us run the 100 meter. And, and all of us sprinters, we loved it. Because we thought, oh, yeah, they're coming to watch us. And truth is, that was the raw, raw of track, of track day. But every one of us sprinters knew we're not the best runners here. 
Those guys who nobody's watching, who are out running the 1,500 and the 3,000, we could never do that kind of stuff. They were the ones who had endurance. We're the flash in the pans. But our heroes, we never said it, but our heroes was those, were those who were running the 1,500, 3,000s, 5Ks, and stuff like that, because they could endure. Guys, this is not a sprint. It's not about looking good in the short term. This is a marathon that we are running. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2 say, say this, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher or perfecter of our faith. It is a marathon. It isn't how you start this race. It's not how well you're doing in the middle of this race. It is how we finish this race. So endure. And have faithfulness, that verse tells us as well. It calls for faithfulness. And that means that we have to have a singular focus as we run. And our singular focus, Hebrews tells us, is Jesus. In order to have that singular focus, we need to be calling on him all the time, every day, in prayer. We need to read his word daily. This is what keeps us focused on him. And then surround yourself with other Christians who are made in his image. Lynn, you are created in the image of Christ. And when I see you, I see the image of Christ. Actually, I do see the image of Christ in you so much. I see it in you, Jane. I see it in you, Joshua, and Bob, and Ken. You guys are the image of Christ to me. And if I were to not come, on, come to church on Sundays, I would not see the image of Christ on a regular basis. But you help keep me focused on Jesus so that I can run the marathon. Thank you for that. Guys, surround yourselves with those made in his image. That's why Hebrews 10.25 says, don't forsake gathering together with other believers as some are in the habit of doing. Why? Because you need to see the image of Christ around you to help you focus. And we need to be obedient. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, let us lay aside everything that hinders. Guys, lay aside everything that hinders. Lay aside the sin that so easily entangles. Maybe it comes through your TV. Maybe it comes through your internet. Maybe it comes through your smartphone. Maybe it comes through the gossip in the, in the hairdressing parlor or whatever. You know, lay it aside and focus on Jesus. Be faithful. Verse 9 tells us, if anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. We haven't heard that said in a long time. The last time it was said was in Revelation chapter 4. But it's saying, listen up, because I'm talking to you. That's what God's saying. Will we listen to God? Do we have ears to hear? He is warning Christians in this chapter. He's not warning the outside world. He's warning Christians in this chapter. Remember why he wrote this. It is a lot of scary stuff, but right in the middle of it, we need to remember that he, he wrote this to us to encourage us and to motivate us. There's a reason he gives us this warning. If we don't have an ear to hear God, then we're gonna listen to someone else. And you know who we're gonna listen to? We're gonna listen to beast number two. All, the, all those servants of beast number one who want our ears and are telling us, follow this, follow this, buy this, get this, and everything's gonna be okay. If we don't listen to God, we are going to be listening to the beast. And the question is, do you have ears to hear? Not just God in this one chapter, but God on every page. Do you have ears to hear? In church, when the pastor's speaking, do you have ears to hear when your brother or sister in Christ comes to you and tries to share something from God's word to you, maybe even rebukes you, do you have ears to hear? Guys, we're not the only one, though, who have ears that need to hear. Like we said, this is written to the church, but we are the watchmen of this world as well. In Ezekiel chapter 33, God tells Ezekiel, he says, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to your people. Speak to your people. Out there in society, speak to your people. 
and tell them, suppose I bring the sword against the, against the land and the people of that land select a man from among them, appointing to him as their watchman. And suppose he sees the sword coming against the land and blows his ram's horn to warn the, warn the people. Then if anyone hears the sound of the ram's horn but ignores the warning, the sword comes and takes him away. His death will be his own fault. Since he heard the sound of the ram's horn but ignored the warning, his death is his own fault. If he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. However, suppose the watchman, the one who knows the word of God, the one who is charged to go tell people out there, suppose that watchman sees the sword coming but doesn't blow the ram's horn so that the people aren't warned and the sword comes and takes their lives away. Then they have been taken away because of their iniquity, yes, but I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Guys, we need to have ears to hear. But there are others who have ears that need to hear as well, and that are those outside of these church doors. Those that we don't think that much of as we sit in here, as we carry on with our week, or maybe we do, and we don't blow the ram's horn. Guys, we need to take this word outside. We are all lemmings in a sense. We all want to follow the path of least resistance. We all want to follow that which looks hopeful. Be careful as Christians that you don't be deceived by a road that leads to destruction. And how do we know that? We stay in the word. We pray to God. We call on God. But on top of it, let's not let others out there follow a road that leads to their destruction. God has built a way back. And that's through Jesus Christ. And it's only through Jesus Christ. He is the road to eternal life. Let us remember that so that we don't succumb to the delusions of Satan. So that we stand on the promises of God. But let us remember that so others don't fall for the delusions of Satan as well. Let's stand on the promises of God. Let's pray.